today for the fourth episode of our Law in Life series. I would like to start by acknowledging the Dark and Young people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, and pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging. We are hoping that, through our series Law in Life, we can provide you with tools and knowledge that are useful to you when you encounter the law in everyday situations. I am Anna Cruikshank and I'm the Managing Director of Aubrey Brown Lawyers. Today we're here to discuss the challenges for business in a post-COVID world. I'm very excited to be joined by my panel here today. I'd like to start by introducing Matt Spindler. Matt is a chartered accountant with over 20 years experience working with small and medium businesses. Matt's key areas of focus are SME tax and accounting, business sales and acquisition, business structures, restructures, business development and compliance. Thank you for coming along, Matt. It's no great problem. to have you here. Thanks for having me. I would like to also welcome Paul Gidley. Paul has specialist expertise and experience in both corporate and personal insolvency and has practiced in corporate recovery and insolvency since 1991. You don't look old enough, Paul. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. <laughs> welcome. Yeah. Paul has detailed experience in the building and construction industry, manufacturing, fabrication and engineering, retail and wholesale, indigenous enterprise and related bodies and the club and motel industry. Our final panellist today is Shani Leith. Shani is a lawyer with over 15 years experience and the team leader of the commercial litigation team at Aubrey Brown Lawyers. Shani has a broad range of experience assisting the owners of small and medium business. Welcome Shani. So, we have come through a unique business environment over the last couple of years. Shani, what types of legal restraints were put in place during COVID to protect businesses and keep them trading? We saw all sorts of restrictions come in play. Some of the main ones were really the quarantine, which has led to significant supply chain delays. Um, we've also seen restriction in movement, so a lot of staff working from home. Um, there was also uh, restrictions in terms of being able to um, enforce debt recovery options. So we saw the statutory demand threshold move from $2,000 up to $20,000 before you could issue that. Mm. Um, and the time frame that moved from 21 days up to six months, which is a significant movement. And then we saw similar changes with the issuing of bankruptcy notices. Um, we also saw restrictions come in play for landlords um, in relation to if an eligible tenant saw a reduction in turnover, then they needed to negotiate the rent down. So there were impacts and restrictions placed on landlords. So those were probably the main ones that I saw. Mm. And Matt, what government incentives were given to businesses to help them keep trading through that period? There were a range of them. Year one, JobKeeper was the, was the main one that followed uh, with the cash flow boost, which were both governed by the ATO. Uh, year two was more pushed down to the state level, um, so the state government incentives, the main one was uh, JobSaver. Um, uh, outside of that, there are a range of smaller uh, industry specific, but the, they were the big incentives that were offered. Mm. Um, I've observed that I think that there are a lot of businesses that manage to continue to trade through COVID because of those um, things that were put in place by the government. Paul. Would you think it's fair to say that there are businesses that are now in financial distress once those incentives and those assistance packages were switched off? Oh, look, m most definitely. I think the, the, the raft of the insolvency measures uh, created to some extent a, a false economy. Um, if I just throw a few stats out there, everyone loves stats. Uh, for 2020, um, uh, 21, we had about 6,000 um, external administrators appointed in insolvency. The, the average number is 12,000. Now, uh, I've extrapolated 22 out. It's about the same number. Mm -hmm. So what you'd have to say there's at least, there's a, there's a backlog of say 12,000 insolvencies, corporate insolvencies that are yet to mm -hmm. manifest in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And then there's going to be obviously the ramifications of the false economy that all that, you know, you throw cash around, you, you print cash, um, it does create a false economy. Mm. And do you feel that there are particular industries where it's more prevalent that there are businesses that um, are at risk at this point in time? Well, well, strangely enough, um, once again, back to the stats, and these can be found on the ASIC website, by the way, uh, the construction industry year upon year 
is the probably the most prevalent or most exposed to insolvency administrations. It's about one, there's, there's, more, well, there's 26 categories across which ASIC maintain external administrations. Um, out of those 26, uh, or out of the say 12 or 13,000 uh, insolvencies, one in nine is in construction. Mm -hmm. So it, all that, the numbers will just increase as the uh, impacts of uh, the COVID economy uh, hit the marketplace and the external administrations increase as well. So, mm. yeah. And the construction industry in particular is also struggling with supply chain issues and in very um, large increase in cost of supplies for them? Oh, yeah, most definitely. Uh, Matt, I'm assuming you would have experienced this with your client base, them just finding it tough to get raw materials, be it sheet metal, be it you know, conduit, whatever. You know. Yeah, across, uh, across a whole range of industries and even even industries that aren't reliant on, say, physical resources or in inputs, uh, it's been on the labour side. Yeah. So a lot of industries have been relying on migration for a long time and when the borders were closed, there's no new migrants coming over. Yes. It became progressively more and more difficult to get people but, combined yeah. with the, these issues. A, a labour issue, yeah, yeah, most yeah. definitely, yeah. It's a significant issue at the moment. Mm. Although, interestingly, I'm experiencing in my client base that as much as there are businesses that have struggled financially, there are businesses who have absolutely boomed during COVID. Has that Brained been your experience? Yes. Yeah, definitely. For, for a range of reasons. <coughs> Some businesses I've, we found that were just in the right place at the right time yeah. in an industry that happened to be advantaged by COVID and the, mm. and, and the lockdown. Um, Instead of looking at particular industries, I try and look at the business and how it would have done if it hadn't made the same decisions or, or those sorts of things. Across the board, the businesses that took a, a double focus, and so not just focusing on the business, but also the business owner early in the piece um, and, and made conscious decisions around where they be, could become more, say, agile or adaptable in both their personal life and their businesses were the ones that typically then outperformed what I would expect through lockdown, COVID mm. and, and everything that came from it. Yeah, mm. yeah. There's, there's definitely a, um, you know, an unusual process happening because of, mainly because of the lockdowns and, uh, you know, people focusing in at their own property and spending money with renovations and uh, people changing out, you know, recycling their own properties to find other places to live, etc. So the construction market went through the roof. The government started punching a lot of cash into infrastructure once again. It's construction, um, IT, logistics, all those industries really boomed. And I, I think if you had a, a sound business pre-COVID and it was one of those industries to benefit out of the impacts of the lockdowns and the government money, you came out of that um, ext you know, extremely well. Mm. But there's then there was the other side. So. Yeah. Just so. tie, tying that into these 12,000 odd businesses that may be in, mm. in, in, in trouble or in difficult times that may not have led to an external administrator being appointed just yet because of the temporary rules that were in, in place. Um, did you, do you see a, a, a correlation between um, how they're doing business prior to that and the situation they're now in? Was the government funding just a stay of execution? Uh, were those businesses already in trouble prior yes, to COVID? Yes, yeah. That, that, look, that's, that's a, a good business is a good business. Yep. You know, you, we don't uh, deal with good businesses. We deal with those businesses that have some type of uh, financial impost. Yep. Uh, in some way, aren't they're not competitive. Um, one of the reasons why there is such a high fallout rate in the construction industry, and, and for that matter, um, you know, cafes, restaurants, they're, they're extremely competitive. And they're usually, you know, reasonably low cost to get into. So that, that and that in, increases the competitiveness. So that's that's probably one of the reasons that those industries do struggle, and they've always got the problems. They just they pre-exist COVID. Yeah. And you're absolutely right, Matt. In terms of a good business has to be agile. <coughs> they have to look at the alternatives, alternative suppliers, alternative products. So a good business knows what they need to do to to flourish. Yeah, excellent. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. The reason I asked to to follow on from. The, my answer was the businesses that boomed, that I found that boomed, were typically well-run businesses before yeah. COVID. Mm -hmm. So they could adapt, mm -hmm. they could make the decisions. The government incentives help just provide some certainty 
and yes. some continuity. But the real difference was the business owners still making decisions, having a plan B, C, and D yes. in case they needed them, and they just got on mm. with things. Mm. And I think I think the whammy is the the supply chain, and not just not just raw materials, as you pointed out. It's across all uh, primary resources for business, all core functions, and that's. That's going to be the big issue going forward for, I think, for all businesses performing good, bad or indifferently. Yeah. Mm. So. Mm. Um, Paul, one of the things that the government introduced actually, I think, a little bit pre-COVID was um, the safe harbour provisions yes. for businesses that weren't <coughs> in significant distress but certainly perhaps had some issues. Can you explain to us what that Look, is? Look, uh, safe harbour in summary is a non-disclosure process um, uh, to assist turn around a business that might be insolvent. So you couldn't be insolvent to go into the safe harbour process. It, it had to be something that was looming. Um, Non-disclosure in that you didn't have to notify creditors or bankers, etc., which uh, or, right, re retains those relationships and also retains value in the, mm. in the assets of the company. Um, from there on, it was uh, like any other consulting task in that uh, you would get, you needed a, uh, a qualified, um, what they call safe harbour practitioner, which is a liquidator or some type of insolvency expert. Um, you usually work in with your solicitors and your accountants and prepare some type of workout plan. But all, you know, they say it's non-disclosure, all those plans require uh, key stakeholders at the table. Mm. So that will usually involve discussions with the banks, discussions with uh, major mission critical large suppliers etc. Um, you would document a plan, you would follow that plan, it would provide a level of in, uh, protection against insolvent trading during that safe harbour period so long as you could prove that uh, you conducted yourself in a manner um, mm. which measured yourself against the safe harbour plan. Mm. Has there been much take up of that? Look be, because it's non-disclosure it's very difficult to uh, say yes it, there has been mm. A uh, lot of the larger firms in the insolvency space have said, you know, we've done a, a quite a few of these uh, particular projects. I've done about three myself, but there are, there's, there's, because you haven't got the moratoriums that you would get, say, under a voluntary mm. administration, mm. you haven't really got that protection to work yourself out. And there's also the exposure of, particularly the safe harbour um, uh, expert, uh, to potential de facto directorship. So there's no mm. protections provided. So to some extent, it, it has been a concern within the industry as to whether or not it's a viable process, particularly for small business to medium business. Mm -hmm. So what I'm um, observing is that there are some businesses that are really booming in our current economy. Some of them perhaps businesses that have um, greatly improved their financial performance during the COVID period and are continuing to, to perform really well businesses that are back to a level that they were pre-COVID and then businesses that are struggling but it perhaps hasn't been as apparent or it's been a slower, um, difficult period for mm. them than it might otherwise have been. Shani, what types of risks do businesses have in this current environment that they mightn't be um, cognizant of? The big one at the moment is that the ATO is now moving forward with enforcing the tax liabilities, the outstanding tax liabilities. So in the last month, the ATO issued more than 50,000 warnings to directors, pay your company tax liabilities or director penalty notices will be issued. The risk with the director penalty notice is that the director become per becomes personally liable for the company's tax liabilities. The sheer number of that many warnings indicates that there's going to be a significant increase of companies that are placed into external administration moving forward. Um, and then if there are more companies that go into liquidation, then businesses are at risk of an unfair preference claim um, or of not getting paid if they're owed money as a creditor. So th at the moment, in the current environment, there are a large number of risks to companies trading. Yeah, the, the tax man is starting to get active again. They've been sitting on their hands for two years. And if we talk about the number of forced wind-ups, uh, you know, go, go back pre-COVID, the tax man would have probably been responsible for half of those. Mm. So that the, the 6,000 I'm talking about that haven't happened each year for the last two financial years mm. are probably going to be um, uh, tax-driven mm. insolvencies. Shani, you mentioned unfair preferences. Can you just elaborate a little bit on what a preference claim is? 
So when a company goes into and ins like becomes insolvent and a liquidator is appointed, the liquidator investigates all of the transactions that occurred. And in that six month period prior to the appointment of the liquidator, if you received money from the company, then it's deemed as an unfair preference. And a demand goes out saying, we, we want that money paid back into the company so that it's prorated to all of the creditors so that each creditor is um, on the same level. One creditor is not being preferred over another. Um, there are defences available if you do receive an unfair preference to try and protect the money that you've received because as a business you've been paid for a service or a product, you've applied it through your business, it's not sitting there available to be paid back to a company that's gone into liquidation. So unfair preferences when companies go into liquidation, they're a matter of course. Um, you send out the, the demand and then it is a matter of each preference, each payment does need to be looked at um, and you do have options available if you receive an unfair preference. Mm. Oh. That means that businesses can be continuing to trade with um, other businesses or suppliers in the ordinary course of business and not actually realise that if they're letting a large debt accrue or alternatively they're accepting payments and that business is letting a large debt accrue with other creditors, there is a potential risk of having to pay money back or not being able to recover the money that you're owed. What good practices do successful businesses have in place to protect themselves against those types of risks, Matt? The, it's always a balancing act. So there, there's a pretty clear set of guidelines around best mm. practice, corporate governance and financial management for businesses. For a lot of independently owned small and medium businesses, they're typically people who are very good technicians and might not have the skill set to implement mm. the, the, the high level financial management protocols, those sorts of things. Um, one of the things that I talk to my clients about is keep it basic. So have a risk register, and I have a very basic spreadsheet that, that, that classifies risk based on their potential impact if they are to occur and their likelihood if they do occur, just to help prioritise where to focus their time and energy. Um, and it's the little habits that you build around there, having monthly figures at the longest to look at and just checking in with those, having three or four key indicators that you look for that could indicate that there's an area that we need to focus on. So that could be a particular debtor's balance in total, it could be individual debtors reaching a certain level, slow down in collections, those sorts of things. Uh, but just some key things that you can look at in five minutes and identify, do you need to focus on that area of the business? Mm. Paul, one of the things I know that insolvency practitioners examine when you're reviewing a business is looking for when the indicators of insolvency, that is that a business can't yes, pay its yeah, debts correct, yeah. when they fall due, um, first come about. What type of things are generally considered to be indicators that a business is insolvent or in financial distress? Well, I'll start off by saying cash flow is king. Mm. Right? And uh, I think a lot of small businesses don't really understand what that means. So. Uh, when we're looking at insolvency, we're talking about cash flow. We're not talking about a balance sheet test, um, what assets you have available. You can't convert a missing critical asset into cash to pay for a debt, otherwise you cease business. So I think small uh, business in particular, um, when they're looking at their uh, solvency status, um, debtors, which uh, is one of the most important you know, circulating assets and keeps the business funded, so they need very strict uh, uh, credit policies and uh, you know, granting of uh, uh, debt collection as well. Um, also managing your aged payables. There's, there's, there's certain thresholds whereby when your unsecured creditors and their ageing reach a certain level, um, they become unserviceable. So if you're starting to get a majority of your uh, trade credit out into uh, 90 days, mm. then you're starting to know there's problems developing. If you're starting to see um, people stop supply uh, wanting CAD, you, you know you've got a problem. If you're not paying your superannuation, if you're not paying your taxes. So, you know, in a nutshell, like in the old days you'd say a cheque would bounce, but no one has a bounced mm. cheque. It's usually you're bouncing off the bottom of your, your EFT limit. So, mm. um, they're the main areas. If you keep your eyes on, obviously, ageing of your payables, ageing of your debtors, because if it's dollar for dollar, you need to collect those amounts. Uh, yeah, so mm. th they would be the main issues I would be considering. Mm. 
And um, Shani, is there anything that should be a red flag to somebody that um, a business they're dealing with might perhaps be heading into financial distress and things that they should be looking at doing from a legal point of view to better um, protect their position? Yeah, absolutely. So if you've got um, debts that are accruing, they're not getting paid, then one of the things that you can look at is security. Um, so what other options have you got available to you in case the company can't pay it? So there's personal guarantees, um, there's registering your interest on the personal property securities register, possibly lodging a caveat if it's appropriate in the circumstances, um, getting cash in tr like in into your trust account before you undertake the work. So there are options and ways that you can mm. secure yourself to make sure that if, if the company goes under, if it goes into liquidation, then you've got other options available to you. And that fits into a comment I made earlier about having a good credit policy. Mm -hmm. And you know, unfortunately, you've, you've got to be firm with your customers. You, you mm. just, a lot of businesses allow things to get too far out of control. And you know, when we're looking at the margin, uh, 100 grand bad debt, could spell insolvency mm. for most small businesses. Mm. And I think that that's a really good point, that businesses should be um, comfortable talking to customers and clients when they can recognise there's starting to be a bit of a lag, perhaps in paying um, debts or phone calls aren't getting returned and that type of thing, and proactively seeking advice on, is there something that we can do so I'm comfortable and you're mm. comfortable and we can continue to work together? Um, a lot of the time we're getting the phone calls when the debt's $200,000 or the company's gone into liquidation or there's been a preference claim served and perhaps there could have been some things put in place um, a little bit earlier on to make everybody a bit more comfortable about the um, position that they end up in. I'm going to ask you each for one key takeaway for um, our viewers to take away today in terms of what you recommend they should be doing in business um, in 2022. Shan? For me, it's act now. Um, so now's the time to be looking at your credit terms, it's to be looking at what security arrangements you've got in place, but it's also not delaying in actually undertaking that debt recovery process because the longer you leave it, the more likely it is that you're not going to get paid. Mm. Paul? Um, probably, look, I'll, I'll come from the aspect of a business that may be suffering some financial problems. I don't believe there's going to be too much leniency. And you mentioned before director's duties. Um, and uh, on the back of that, obviously, insolvent trading is a major breach. Mm. So I think um, tying that back into cash flow, businesses need to understand exactly where they stand going forward and whether they're going to be able to meet those debts as the market starts to tighten, which it, it will tighten. Mm. Mm. Matt? I would say agility again, staying mm. agile. If it, if there's anything we've learned from the last couple of years is if you have that element of agility where you can change quickly uh, or scale up or scale backwards, it places the business in a much better position. There was some of that prior to COVID as the, the, the business environment was evolving. We've come from a period where everything was a bricks and mortar business yes, through yeah. the rise of technology, yes. but to the point in time when, when, when COVID first occurred, we were still using that technology mm. in our old business models with our old infrastructure, with long-term leases, um, lots of long-term employees, which makes it very difficult to adapt quickly. Uh, it's not you have to throw all that stuff away. Mm. You just have to have a plan B and a C and know if a particular situation arises, what would be our highest priority actions. Mm. Mm. Fantastic. Well, thank you all. It's certainly been an mm. interesting couple thank you, of Anna. years. Yeah. And Thanks. I think that um, you know there are a lot of opportunities in the marketplace for business if the, um, the business owners are of a growth mindset mm. and adaptable and um, able to recognise and act quickly on yeah. opportunities uh, when act they Act proactively, arise. exactly. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Um, the next episode of Law in Life will be released soon. We hope that you can join us and continue to watch them. Please keep an eye out for them on our social media and share with your family and friends. Thank you.